Madam President. The Senator from Kentucky. The best part of any debate is when you see people twisting themselves in knots, going, into, going against their own alleged principles to get their desired results. Today the subject is war powers. The hawks and the neocons somehow want you to believe, in contrast to all logic, that the President of the United States has the unitary power to go to war anytime he wants, anywhere, free from interference from Congress. That's their stated position. Anytime war comes up. Yet today, in the NDAA, they say they now want a president that cannot leave a war without their permission. How absurd is that? They believe that a president has the power to go to war anywhere, anytime, but when a president tries to remove troops, they say, oh, no, no, what we really want are 535 generals in Congress to tell him he can't leave a war. How absurd is that? It's exactly the opposite of what both the Constitution and logic would dictate. When Congress tried to impose time limits on troop engagements during the Iraq War, the neocons squawked that it would be a mistake to have 535 generals. They said the execution of the war was a prerogative of the president until the president decided he wanted to leave a war. During the Bush administration, Dick Cheney and a team of legal apologists argued for something they call the unitary executive theory. Professor Edelson at American University describes this theory of an all-powerful commander-in-chief concept. This unitary executive theory claimed to justify effectively unchecked presidential power over the use of military force, the detention and interrogation of prisoners, extraordinary rendition, and intelligence gathering. According to the unitary executive theory, since the Constitution assigns the president all of the executive power, he can set aside laws that attempt to limit this power over national security. This is an enormous power. Critics say that it effectively puts the president above the law. But this is the belief of the neocons. They say the president is all-powerful until they say, well, unless the president's trying to stop a war, then we must shackle the president with rules and regulations and make sure that he cannot leave a war unless Congress says so. That's what the NDAA will do this year. Now, these same people who advocated for virtually unlimited commander-in-chief powers have put forth limits in this bill to restrain a president from removing troops from a country. Effectively, these neocons put forth a belief that the commander-in-chief has virtually unlimited power to initiate war, but they are just fine with hamstringing and preventing the commander-in-chief from ending a war. Hypocrisy, anyone? Without a shred of embarrassment, these neocons happily constrain a president from leaving a war theater while they also simultaneously argue for a president that can start war anytime, anywhere, across the globe without congressional authorization. Our founding fathers would be appalled. Primary among our founders' concerns was that the power to initiate war not be in the hands of one person. As Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, the executive is the branch of government most prone to war. Therefore, the Constitution, with studied care, vested the war-making powers in the legislature. To our founders, initiation of war was the sole prerogative of Congress. But a great deal of discretion was given to the president in Article II to execute the war. The neocons forever believed in this discretion. They said the war shouldn't be fought by 535 generals in Congress. We should give the president the freedom and power to execute the war. And largely they're correct until they pop their heads up today and say, unless the president wants to stop a war, then we take it all back. What we really want is the president who can't execute a war or execute the end of a war without the permission of Congress. Likely our founders would have agreed with the common complaint that we don't need 535 generals in Congress. In other words, success in war requires most decisions on executing the war to be in the hands of one person, the president. Even I, who have been opposed to most of the recent overseas activities and wars, 
Even I believe that once Congress initiates it, most of the decisions should be made by the president. So the decision to go to war requires the consensus, the initiation, the beginning of war requires the consensus of 535 members of Congress under the Constitution. It's very clear. They debated it over and over, and they said, initiation, declaration of war, should be done by Congress. But the execution of the war would largely be left up to the president. Many, many current and former members of Congress have agreed. Representative Liz Cheney has argued that the nature of military and foreign policy demand the unity of the singular executive, and that the founders certainly did not intend, nor does history substantiate, the idea that Congress should legislate specific limits on the president's powers in wartime. Liz Cheney, who is also, ironically, the author of this amendment to the NDAA, she said we shouldn't limit the president's powers in times of war, and then she authors a limitation on the president removing troops from war. So which is it? I guess she's only for this unitary power. She's only for this all-powerful commander-in-chief when they fight war. But if a president wants to end a war, oh no, Congress has to stop them at all costs from ending a war. I think what comes out of this is that the neoconservative philosophy isn't so much about a unitary executive, isn't so much about an all-powerful commander-in-chief. The philosophy of these people is about war and substantiating war and making sure that it becomes and is perpetual war. Senator Graham said, the one thing he has been consistent on is that there's one commander-in-chief, not 535, these are his words. I believe this commander-in-chief and all future commanders-in-chief are unique in our Constitution and have an indispensable role to play when it comes to protecting the homeland. If we have 535 commanders-in-chief, then we are going to be less safe. I guess except for this bill, which actually creates 535 generals in Congress to tell the president, not just this president, and some of it is anger, it's partisan anger, people don't like President Trump, but this will bind all future presidents. This isn't just about this president. So when Lindsey Graham says we don't want 530 commanders in chief, if this is his belief, he should vote against this bill because this bill creates 535 commanders in chief. The late Senator McCain said, it would be a very serious situation where we now have 535 commanders in chief. The President of the United States is the only commander in chief. Senator Inhofe, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, has said, we don't need 535 generals in Congress telling our troops how to win this fight, except for we are going to pass a bill that I assume all of these folks will vote for that actually creates 535 generals in Congress to say to the president, to this one or any president, that he can't leave the theater in, in Afghanistan without their permission. It's a tragedy, it's hypocrisy, and it's a terrible bill. Of course, there's also former Vice President Dick Cheney, who is adamant that the War Powers Resolution, which requires the president to simply report to Congress on matters of war, was unconstitutional and an infringement of the president's authority as commander-in-chief. Senator Alexander has also said there's a reason why we don't have 535 commanders-in-chief or 100 commanding generals each saying, charge down this street or over that hill. I tend to agree. Except for it seems to be one-sided. These people seem to believe that there, we shouldn't have 535 generals in Congress when it's about initiating war. But when it comes to removing troops from the battle, when it comes from finally coming home after America's longest war in Afghanistan, they all say, oh, no, no, you're wrong. We're not going to let you come home. We are going to restrict and restrain the powers of the commander-in-chief because we don't want to end the Afghan war. It seems as if the only thing you can conclude is they really don't care about their theory of an all-powerful commander-in-chief. They care more about perpetuating the Afghan war. Until recently, this chorus of voices sang of nothing but the almighty, endless powers that presidents have as commander-in-chief. That is, until a president arrived on the scene who wanted to reduce overseas troop levels and end America's longest war in Afghanistan. 
Then the promoters of a strong commander-in-chief suddenly jumped ship and began advocating the opposite. They began advocating that 535 members of Congress should indeed become generals and should limit the president's ability to remove troops from Afghanistan. Which is it? Are you for this unlimited power of the president to commence and execute war? Or are you only for it when they're initiating war, when they are continuing war and against presidential prerogative if the president chooses to end a war? Shouldn't we call out this hypocrisy? Shouldn't someone stand up and express and expose this rank demagoguery? Shouldn't someone cry foul that the advocates of unlimited presidential power want it only to apply when that president advocates for war? But the moment a president advocates to end a war or lessen overseas troops and these deployments, he or she must be shackled by 535 generals. This defense authorization bill could more aptly be called a bill to prevent the president from ending the Afghan war. We never actually give the real titles to the bill, but that would be an accurate title. A bill to prevent the president from ending the Afghan war. As such, any serious advocate for ending the Afghan war should vote against this monstrosity. The neocon advocates for unlimited presidential war powers should own up to their hypocrisy and admit that their love of perpetual war trumps their off-stated unitary executive theory. In reality, the neocons are enamored of their theory of unbounded presidential power only when that power is used to foment war. The minute a president decides to end war, the neocons' true stripes are exposed as they beat their chests and proclaim, as 535 generals might, that the president will not be allowed to remove troops without congressional permission. This bill sets a very dangerous precedent for limiting a president's power to end war and should be vigorously opposed.